Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Amisha, can you start? Did the speaker join? Good morning. Uh, did the speaker join? Amisha? Yes, yes, I have joined. Ah, okay, okay. Amisha? Yeah, can you start? Yes, Yes, ma'am, we can start. Ha, huh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome all the participants of today's webinar. I'm delighted to, to see a big number of registrations in the Google Meet and uh, as well as YouTube. We have uh, registrations from uh, regional, national, and international level too, including our LMLI and the ex-staff members, especially Dr. Susan Anand. I think she has joined from international, I think, Ethiopia. I'm not very sure of it. Welcome, ma'am. I would like to thank and acknowledge all my staff of the Department of OBG Nursing and Upper Nursing College. A hearty welcome to Dr. Emmy Smitha, the resource person of today. May I request you to on the camera, Dr. Smitha? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, we can see you. Yes. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker who is going to be going to talk about reproductive choices. This subject, subject is very much important in current scenario. Having 20 years of experience in the OBG nursing, I feel Dr. M. Smitha is an apt person to throw light on this subject. She has completed her BSc from Amishwati College of Nursing, Mangalore, PG from Padamullas, Mangalore, and PhD under National Consortium, INC. A dynamic and active personality who kept updating herself through publications, being resource person at national and international level, and by be being member of various association. Thank you, uh, madam, for consenting to be the speaker. Over to you, Dr. Smita. Um, I've given very small uh, uh, bird's eye view for, uh, for biodata. I apologize for that. And thank you. Welcome, Dr. Smita. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Janet, for the elaborate uh, uh, introduction to me. And uh, I am overwhelmed uh, to be uh, amidst of uh, uh, such a big uh, uh, group today. At the outset, let me thank Principal Dr. Lena Casey for giving me this wonderful opportunity. And I congratulate the organizers for having chosen this wonderful topic. Uh, please give me a moment to share my slide. Amisha, can you stop sharing your slide? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we can see your slide, but uh, need a slideshow. Yes. Yes, done. You can unmute Dr. Smita. Yeah. There's some issue, I guess. With yeah, the I cannot network. Uh, let me. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, it's visible, it's visible. but not yes. in the slideshow mode. Yes, yes, I'm making that. I guess this is yes, uh, fine yeah. now. Done, done, yeah. done, done, done. Yes, yes. So um, let me uh, introduce to the International Day of Actions for Women's Health theme for 2021. Uh, because uh, let me just uh, introduce briefly about. 
uh, what is the reason why we have been celebrating International Day of Action for Women's Health? Uh, it's been uh, celebrated over 30 years. And uh, you must be wondering, we have a lot of days for women. Recently, we celebrated International Day uh, for Women. And then why is it that we have a lot of other days? So here, if you look into it, we have an action word here. So this day is not just celebrating women, but here is beyond talking. We need to take some action, some deliberation for upliftment of women's health, which is being pathetic all over the world. It's not just in developing and underdeveloped countries, but all over the world, women are discriminated on some or the other grounds. So women's health do matter. And we need to see that the health indexes are uh, improved and end inequality during the pandemic. So this particular theme is very, very significant. I can give example of my own setting in Odisha where the health indexes are very poor, especially among women. And with the first wave of lockdown, our entire OPD services were closed and we had only the emergency service. And uh, by this time, the women lost their job, the family income uh, perished or reduced. There were no means of transportation. If at all there were transportation means, they had to pay a huge price. And then it was a very, very uh, difficult uh, situation for women. And women have suffered very badly. Why the suffering has happened? Because we have deployed the healthcare providers, including the grassroots workers, for shifting their uh, concentration on managing the COVID cases than the uh, pregnant women, postnatal women, or newborn women. And we were shocked when the uh, uh, the uh, lockdown was relaxed. The type of cases which we had to deal were very pathetic. We had high number of cases of intrauterine death, intrauterine growth retardation, and not even a single woman came uh, for the delivery had a single antenatal checkup. They were all in the third trimester, so the checkups were um, pending. And there were high complications of uh, uncontrolled blood sugar. And there was an alarmingly increased rate of ectopic rupture, ectopic pregnancy, and pregnancy-induced complication. We had a woman uh, who had HB level of 1%. I have never seen such cases in my life. So the women's health has taken a serious uh, uh, downfall during this pandemic and we need to end this inequality during this second wave of pandemic which is going to be even uh, severe among the pregnant and postnatal women and sexual and reproductive health is very very essential in a country where uh, the things related to sex is hushed up because of the taboo associated with and sex is a very very sensitive matter we hardly ever speak of sex Hence, this area has to be addressed for the overall health of the woman. Now, the topic given to me is a reproductive health, right to make choices. So, with each of my talk, each of my cases, what I'm presenting to you, I would request you to ponder, as women, do we really have much choices in the healthcare system we have uh, being given by the government and other healthcare uh, services. So this is a brief outline of my talk. I'll be uh, talking a bit about the uh, International Day of Action for Women's Health, the Reproductive Health, Government of India Initiative uh, for the Reproductive Health, analysis of current status of our country, and some of the solutions or recommendations for what are the gaps or the lacuna in our healthcare services. So the International Day of Action for Women's Health was first uh, celebrated on 28 March of 1987 in order to promote sexual and reproductive health and rights of all women globally. And we have been celebrating it for the past 30 years now. So it reiterates that every woman has a right to sexual and reproductive health and right, no matter um, 
her uh, no matter the caste she belongs to the uh, area of residence or her sexual orientation whatever it is a woman has a hundred percent right to um, seek sexual and reproductive health and to raise awareness on the issues related to women's health and this is the best platform to remind the government and the policy makers that women's health really matters because the next generation of the country depends upon the health of the woman. Only a healthy woman can bring forth a healthy newborn and a healthy child and she can raise the child to a healthy adolescent. So the future of the nation lies in the women's health of the country. So this is a, a ladder of uh, the treaties, international treaties, which has taken place uh, in uh, collaboration with 179 countries and India is a signatory to it. And the India, Indian government is responsible for maintaining the equality of women and also improving the health of the women as well as upholding the sexual and reproductive health of the women. So the first international conference on the human rights was held in the year 1968, whereby they recognized that sexual health and the reproductive health is an integral part of human right and it cannot be compartmentalized. And further modification was taken place in declaration of Mexico in the year 1975, whereby equality of women in marriage in workplace was recognized. And with the Vienna declaration, the right to marry, right to uh, remain unmarried, uh, right to have children, right to not have children, all were included in the human rights. And similarly, various ICTP, uh, ICPD uh, declaration, Beijing declaration, all of them reiterated the women's right to sexual and reproductive health, given the choices of information and various health services. And you all must be aware of the Millennium Development Goal, which was established in the year 2000, uh, um, which uh, had severe lacuna because of its uh, targets and compartment review. To overcome those gaps and pitfalls, uh, SDG goals were uh, formulated. Still, it has some more lacuna, but at least a, a comprehensive approach was adopted for the health of the women. So indirectly or directly, these treaties lead to the uh, uh, upholding of sexual and reproductive health. So let me tell you what is sexual health. So sexual health is an indispensable and indivisible part of human rights and its roots lie in the right to health. So when a person has a right to health, the person also has a right for the sexual health and the well-being is not just limited to disease prevention, but also include autonomy to decide whom to have relationship with, to decide uh, the uh, type of partners, whether it is a same-sex partner or homosexual or bisexual, the person has the entire right to it. And also there is a right to pleasure with reference to sexuality. And when the right to pleasure is breached by harm, definitely it is a violation of the sexual right on the sexual health of the woman. Now, this is a definition given by uh, the Vienna Conference on the Reproductive Rights and the Reproductive Health. So reproductive right is a complete uh, state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease of infirmity as in the case of any health. And also, it pertains to the matters relating to the reproductive system, its function and process. So reproductive health implies that the people are able to have a satisfying and safe sex life and they have the capacity to reproduce and freedom to decide when, how often they have to exercise their reproductive rights. Now, the uh, sexual uh, reproductive health rights include the following right receive information on sexuality and sex education. So uh, just go back to your school days. Uh, even though we 
tell about sexual education what kind of information we require about sexuality and sex education it should be comprehensive in nature so what kind of sex education do we get in our indian setup is it comprehensive no in an analysis report uh, says that the indian sex education is clearly not in par with the international standards because it does not have any uh, topics related to sex orientation or same sex uh, sexual relationship etc so what are the issues uh, we have come across so when you remember or recollect your sex education classes the teacher is shy to talk the teach any question raised by the student is uh, uh, frowned upon and the teacher says that you will learn it when you grow up and um, and the ncert has come with an adult uh, education package with all the sensors as it happens in our indian cinema so it is cut here and there and uh, it is implemented in all cbse schools and avodhya vidyalaya and when it has come to the analysis of the implementation of eep package the teachers restrict themselves uh, on talking about menstruation menstrual hygiene and uh, reproductive parts physiology and anatomy that is all and there is the end of the education and the teachers when asked why is it that you are not able to speak on sexuality and sex to the children they say um, uh, it is not culturally appropriate it is not socially appropriate and one of the weirdest reason given by the teachers are the children lose respect if i speak openly about sex so these are the uh, hardcore reality of uh, sex education which is taking place in our country my son came and told me few months back mom i think i can uh, talk about sex education better than my teachers she she tells only pieces here and there and we have to really think what she is telling so a clear comprehensive sex education is not imparted so what are the dangers of this the children as you all know with this online classes they have easy access to internet and the all information what they seek about sexual let it they get from the pornographic sites which is very very dangerous because the image or the concept of sex and sexuality what they form during the adolescent stage is very very crucial uh, for throughout their life so if they develop a wrong uh, mental setup regarding or unhealthy uh, concepts of sexuality it is carried over throughout their adult life and they are not able to have a happy sexual life and moreover it could lead to so many social problems like sexual harassment rape discrimination and all kind of harms in the society and imparting a comprehensive sexual education is very very very, very essential and besides that as i have already told you to decide when to have children whether to be married or not uh, but uh, as indian girls and women do we really have a choice to be remain unmarried to remain unmarried just ponder on that and besides that safe abortion post abortive care maternity care use of modern contraceptive methods and prevention and care and treatment of std and infection are all included in sexual and reproductive health rights of women and uh, sex and uh, you know we we uh, are from a country where kama sutra is still uh, followed or revered by people all around the world and we have a magnificent uh, uh, history on our sexuality uh, how many of you have uh, seen this uh, temple or aware of this temple this is a beautiful uh, temple a sun temple of konark in odisha and uh, this was one i consider or many of us believe that this was the um, sex education what the ancestors would uh, uh, impart to the generation which is to follow so that they uh, could um, have a healthy sexual life and could uh, have produce healthy children so when Uh, our history itself is so rich on imparting sexual education on reproductive health 
why is it that the Indian uh, society is shying away about talking about sex and sexuality? So how do you know that you are sexually healthy? How often uh, have we talked about sex or sexual health? Can you just remember, have you talked to your partner about your sexual health or your peer or your healthcare worker? It's been how many years since we have spoken about our body, our functioning? So to an adult, for an adolescent, you got to empower them or you know you need to make them uh, feel a person to be sexually healthy or an adolescent to be sexually healthy if he is comfortable talking about the body and sexuality. So it all starts from the home. We need to shed inhibition from uh, the family itself as parents. We need to take the responsibility to impart comprehensive sex education to our children. No uh, matter how young the child is because we divide the education package during puberty uh, during uh, marriage the contraceptive thing so puberty menstruation menstrual hygiene uh, uh, during uh, the marriage and uh, post marriage it is about contraception spacing and menopause it is about managing menopause and all that drugs but have we ever thought a child could be sexually molested or exploited even before the uh, puberty sets and the study shows that 73 children are molested at one point of their lives even before achieving menarche hence it is very very essential that the teachers health workers especially parents take responsibility to impart age appropriate sexual um, education to their children and whereby they feel uh, that their body is not violated they are proud of their body they have a positive uh, self-concept about their body they recognize the risk and they find out and they know the ways to reduce them they set the boundaries when it comes to sex and sexual relationship and they know where to access and use the healthcare services and they are able to form a healthy so now what are the different human rights linked to reproductive rights so the right to health as i already told you uh, includes the right to sexual health and the reproductive health so the three A's and Q's of the reproductive health services are availability, accessibility, acceptability, quality of care. So uh, just to ponder uh, or just to bring back the uh, postings of your PHC days or a visit to PHC, just see whether there are adequate number of trained staff to cover the entire population do we have adequate number of doctors do we have adequate number of trained nurses is there a provision for clean drinking water is there sanitation proper sanitation essential medicines many of the times either the doctors and nurses are in the register with uh, sheer physical absence the there is no provision for drinking water uh, and uh, the patient usually has to pay from their pockets to buy the medicines because most of the time it will be outside the stock or not available. So accessibility, just think about the access of a person with a disability. A person with disability um, by uh, default is uh, decided by the Indian society that they have no sexual feelings and they have no rights for sexuality and they are considered as sexually inactive beings. But no, the right to sexual health and reproductive health uh, entitles even the person with disability to seek contraceptive devices. So taboo and uh, uh, other things are associated, stigmas associated with it, but still the right to access even for a person with disability is upheld by the constitution rights of every citizen of the country and also it should be affordable in terms of essential medicines and services at no cost or at least at a minimum cost based on the equality and the sexual services and the reproductive services should be
culturally appropriate, sensitive to gender, age, disability, sexual diversity, so that it is acceptable to all and it should be good quality services befitting the reproductive health. So this is all in theory, but in reality, you all know how the service, the public health uh, service is. So we cannot isolate the sexual health and reproductive health from the health. So we, we, we need to take multifactorial uh, dimensions such as nutrition, sanitation, uh, provision of livelihood, good quality education, comprehensive information, health care, non-discriminated care and education for all women in this country in order to have a reproductive health of the woman. So let me come to the second right, right to life and, and right to liberty. So right to life implies we have the right to have uh, extended life expectancy. So when you have to have an expected uh, extended life expectancy, you should prevent unwanted abortion. So has every woman accessible has accessibility for uh, abortion services, safe abortion services? We have abortion services. You would not believe, according to Gutmacher uh, Agency, uh, the study shows that six out of six million abortion taking place in India, only one million abortions are safe abortion. So the 5 million abortions are clandestine and unsafe abortion where the woman is led uh, to all the exposed to all dangers of uh, uh, disability and even death. So do we really have a choice? A woman who is not married or a woman who is poor, do they have this right to liberty for access to abortion? Do ponder on that point. The next uh, right is non-discrimination and equality. Uh, the non-discriminative right is it being exercised in all healthcare system. Is all women or all individual approaching health system uh, treated with equality? We all know the truth. There is a high level of discrimination based on socioeconomic status on the caste, on the religion, when it comes to health. So what is the danger of discrimination? When you are discriminated, the discrimination could be direct discrimination from the healthcare provider, or it could be an indirect discrimination by the uh, form of law. For example, uh, the abortion laws. So it says that, uh, mm, you know, you if it is a minor, uh, you have to have the consent or if you do not have an other card you cannot do an ultrasonography and hence you cannot have uh, abortion so most of the time the uh, marginalized women are uh, discriminated so that they do not seek healthcare services which leads to illness and this is a visual cycle which is going to uh, badly affect the right reproductive health of the women and right to education and information do uh, do women of uh, marginalized section have real right to quality education and information please think over it and come out with some action plan what we could do to empower this women because until and unless we impart a quality education and comprehensive email information, the women do not have a choice. I would like to give an example. In 2004, I had uh, been to Bangalore for some university related work and I happened to meet uh, two of my friends over dinner and they took me to an Italian restaurant and they said uh, you could order whatever you want to order. So I'm looking at the menu and uh, I'm uh, going through each of the thing and I, I really, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not able to understand what are these stuff. So it is uh, uh, it, the choice what you have is based on the information. So luckily I found a hamburger. So I had ordered that. So the, I had information only on hamburger. So even ha if I have platter of choices, even if you have a, 
a choice of contraception and you do not have comprehensive information as women where do we stand and do we really have a choice i would like you ask each of this right as women of underprivileged section do we really stand uh, we do we really have a choice and the next right is to enjoy the benefit of scientific progress so the scientific progress in terms of reproductive health um, pertains or we can uh, point to the progress in the modern contraceptive device how many of us are really aware of it or uh, how many of the women in our country have real access to it so if you look into the family planning campaign and the target which are given to the public health centers primary health centers you are not left with any benefits of scientific progress nobody ever tells you about or promotes the modern contraceptive device so is a case with the infertility services how many primary health centers provide infertility centers which is quality center and at a cost which is affordable for the women so as a women do we really have a choice the next right is right to privacy and to marriage and family life so the moment the girl child is born it is fed into the mind of the child by the parents that you are not the property of this house you are a pariah property and you will be married off soon and you will uh, be gone so this kind of concept is put into the child's mind right from a very young age and do we really have a choice to remain unmarried a very uh, small uh, portion proportion of women uh, who are educated they are uh, um, strong enough uh, to say no to marriage but even if you're single what are the dangers of remaining single in the indian society you all know but still do we have a choice for that and a right to privacy when it comes to abortion uh, you know uh, there was a particular case in delhi whereby a woman is married off at a very young age at uh, 18 years uh, to a 40 year old man and uh, uh, the girl undergoes uh, domestic violence on daily basis and she conceives at as a result of marital rape so she goes to a, a clinic and uh, she asks for an abortion but the doctor there says that you have to first file an fir on domestic violence and then come back i cannot take up this case and he counsels the woman against the abortion and the woman is 10 weeks those time and those day and then she approaches an ngo by the time it is already 13 weeks she takes her to another clinic but the same thing happens there and she gets a, a bottle pills over the counter and she has severe bleeding and she has to be admitted so does she have a choice here to her privacy to her marriage and her family life so this with all uh, though we have all the rights but as women of underprivileged section in our country do we really have a choice so let me just briefly tell about the indian scenario so what uh, uh, we know is a maternal health is one of the most uh, uh, you know um, neglected areas or the most affected areas in women's health because we have high maternal mortality rate which we have still not been able to bring it down to 70 in spite of all the push up pushing up to the institutional delivery uh, and also there is rampant anemia not only among the uh, pregnant women but also among the adolescent girls there is high um, incidents of domestic violence especially it has rose to 73% in some of the states with this lockdown and also other issues like uh, suicide is a major concern among women's health in india
So what are the intervention government of India has adopted? You know the reproductive acid services has been upgraded to reproductive, maternal, newborn, child health and adolescent health and Janani Suraksha Yojana whereby the monetary uh, benefits are given to the woman uh, through ASHA for the institutional delivery and Janani Shishu Suraksha Karikram whereby free transportation, free medicines, free uh, uh, cesarean and uh, delivery uh, services are provided to women. Pradhan Mantri uh, Surakshit Matritva Abhiyan, whereby ninth of every month the maternity services are provided and Pradhan Mantri Matritva Vandana Yojana uh, with the monetary benefit of 5,000 which will be given 6, 000, made to 6,000 at the discharge for the first child delivered in the institution. There are other uh, initiatives also. So uh, what have we achieved by this government initiative? We could uh, achieve healthcare and medication facility to some extent, protect women from STD, HIV, AIDS, uh, bring about uh, understanding of contraceptive by ASHA workers, grassroots level, safe and uh, legal abortion facilities were uh, available in primary care, improvement in health sector, women's health, and overall, there was an attempt made by the government of India to improve the sexual and reproductive health and rights of women. Now, if we analyze the government of India maternal health programs, there are various issues of public health system. There are major lacunas and gaps. The first and foremost, as you all are aware, there is a low public investment. So even though we have seen an increase of 1.2 to 2.1 over the years in the national health policies, it is still very minimal compared to the population we have to cover, which results in poor infrastructure, poor medical and diagnostic facility, poor maintenance, in inadequately skilled human resources. And also this has given an opportunity for the uh, mushrooming of privatization and corporatization of healthcare and also the absence of robust regulation has uh, capitalized or reap, are reaping the benefits of uh, the private players in the health sector, which is very, very hazardous to us. So in the no new national policy, it is uh, projected that the public investment is to increase to 2.5 uh, percentage by 2025, but the areas of investment are, uh, are still not clear. So this is again um, a report by uh, Gutmacher organization, whereby the green, light green, uh, depicts the poorest of people. They, you can see that only 23% of them make the WHO recommended four antenatal care visits and 63 percentage in fact with all the government initiatives we can see that 63 percentage of poor deliver in healthcare facility and only 45 percentage have 24 hours postnatal checkup so does poor women of india have a choice to exercise their right Please ponder on it. And out of uh, pocket expense is a major issue. You can see for a normal delivery on an average, uh, a family spends around 8,719 rupees. And you can see in Manipur, it is quite high. Uh, it's about 10,000 rupees. So I would uh, like to give a case study of uh, Farida Begum in um, she belonged to, I mean, she was uh, from Assam and uh, she uh, was uh, uh, attending all the antenatal checkups and there was an ASHA worker. And on uh, uh, 27th February night, she had her labor pains and she called up ASHA. And uh, she said, uh, you have to wait till the next day morning because there are no doctors or nurses in the bhc so next day morning the husband uh, accompanies the wife to the bhc which is two kilometer away so if you know in silchar 
the roads are very treacherous there are no good roads there are hilly areas and access to phc is very difficult and after 10 o'clock the doctor arrives and uh, uh, he refuses to even have a look on the laboring woman in spite of pleas by the husband and uh, uh, after a while she delivers a baby and the uh, anm uh, conducts the delivery and she has a profuse bleeding following delivery and she is uh, referred to the state medical hospital but then the husband does not have the money to uh, uh, transport and the ambulance service is not there because all ambulance drivers were on strike and the doctor uh, gives some money and tells okay you take uh, to the nearby hospital so nearby hospital is a mission hospital the poor guy takes a uh, lady over there, Farida Begum, and then um, the uh, she has to be uh, on blood transfusion. And this poor guy had to spend around twenty-seven thousand to buy blood. But in spite of that, the condition of Farida deteriorates, and she is uh, told to transport to the state medical uh, hospital, medical college hospital. And again, uh, the husband borrows money from the neighbors and all the relatives and uh, admits the patient, but she succumbs to bleeding by 6.30 PM. So in, you can see the major drawbacks of our public health system. You can see that there was unavailability of the health professional they were not skilled enough to manage the situation. There was no transportation and the, um, there was a gross violation of human right which has taken place here. This is just one lady among 810 women dying every year in the world. So remember, for every day on an average 810 women die in um, uh, low income countries and middle income countries and india in india contributes a major share of maternal death so these are uh, some of the things uh, i want to tell on access to information and utilization of contraceptive services based on information so uh, autonomy and informed consent in the context of contraception so I would like to quote a case study of Anjali Devi, who is 30 years from Bihar. She had uh, five live children, and the sixth one uh, was delivered in an institution, the primary health center. And um, um, they asked for the consent of a PPIUCD, for which they denied consent. But after some time, a relative comes, and they see that the Anjali uh, Devi is in profuse bleeding and they uh, learned that they had introduced uh, PPIUCD even without the consent of the woman. So what kind of uh, information do we give? We just tell only the advantages. How do we tell about the side effects and dangers? We hardly do that and moreover we breach the uh, consent right to consent or autonomy of uh, uh, the client over here and what happens is she is referred to the district hospital again there is no transportation services they take her in auto rickshaw and on the way she succumbs to bleeding again she adds to our statistics of maternal mortality the next issue is sterilization a camp approach which is a gross violation of human rights so um, you know, uh, the government uh, uh, advertisement of two family child and the target center for the ASHA and other workers in grassroots level, they prompt uh, uh, women for sterilization. Though we have a lot of other contraceptive uh, measures, always women are targeted. It is a highly discriminative approach when it comes to sterilization. And uh, this particular case story, I would like to uh, narrate is about Rekha of Bilaspur uh, district of Chhattisgarh. She was one among 13 women who were gathered by Asha for a sterilization camp. And um, uh, by night, Rekha and other 12 women started uh, vomiting 
and they were taken to hospital and all of them many of them uh, you know they were sick and out of them the 13 women succumbed to infection they all died they all added to our maternal mortality rate 13 women can you imagine so the, there were a lot of inquiry against a doctor who had performed the laparoscopic surgery, but as usual, the doctor comes out neat. Though there was gross violation of the norms to prevent infection during this uh, laparoscopic technique, it was severely violated. So does this woman have a chance? Forget about reproduction. Do they have even the right to life? So these are some of the things or the live picture of what is happening in our country in which is a breach of reproductive and sexual right of uh, the women. And there are other cases of denial of sterilization. Uh, this uh, case is about uh, Mrs. Rani Chand Baiga. She belongs to a tribal community and the government of India in 1979 has uh, denied sterilization to primitive tribe groups or particularly vulnerable tribe groups of India. She already has five children and her monthly income is only 2,400 per month and she wants to have a sterilization done and she is denied sterilization. Again, this is a breach to the reproductive health. So does she have a choice here? Does she have uh, a right to exercise her choice, ponder on this. Now, the next one is access to abortion care and services. Um, so uh, one of the maid working in uh, Chandigarh, a poor, very poor lady, she has uh, three live children and uh, she goes to, uh, for the abortion, safe abortion services, she is denied service because she does not have an Aadhaar card and she is perceived as a migrant labor who is not a citizen of India and she is denied access to abortion care. So what she does is she goes to a quack and she uh, gets an abortion done but ends up in terrible con uh, complication of injury and bleeding and she has to be hospitalized for a very, very long time. So does she have a choice or did she have a choice? And the medical termination uh, pregnancy amendment bill of 2014 is a welcoming one uh, because it has uh, enhanced the uh, week, I mean, uh, the period of uh, termination of pregnancy from 20 weeks to 24 weeks with the expert opinion of two medical practitioner and also abortion, early abortion can be carried out by um, healthcare professional other than the doctors such as Ayush uh, doctors uh, and also uh, trained nurses, registered nurses, ANMs. So this is a welcome move. We need to see on implementation how it's going to work out. But again, this has a grave danger of sex selection because by 24 weeks, the sex of the baby is very pronounced and uh, it could uh, uh, lead to uh, violence against the unborn female fetus. Now, the two-child norm is a violation of reproductive health and rights. So as a child, when we uh, would view Dutashin, the logo is uh, hum do, hamare do, and a family cannot be happier if they have more than two children. And there were uh, two uh, uh, students in my class. I still remember we used to mock them for having uh, three siblings each. So that is a set norm in the Indian uh, mentality that if you go for more than two children, you are doing something wrong. It is some kind of crime. So many of them are or many of us are not even aware of our rights because the health benefits are given to only two children, the monetary benefits only for two uh, children. And above that, you are uh, denied all um, other benefits to such an extent that in some of the states, they are not even allowed to contest for election if they have 
two more than uh, two children. So this results in forced abortion, sex selective abortion, divorces, dissertation, disowning of the third child, especially if the third child is a girl, they just abandon it. You can see in newspaper, the girl child abandoned, especially in places like Od Odisha, Chhattisgarh, uh, having a child, a girl child is uh, uh, some kind, they consider something uh, very, very bad. I have seen in my own experience, I have, uh, you know, um, felt really sad at the state uh, uh, how the girl child is discriminated even uh, at the time of birth, from the time of birth. There was a case whereby um, the woman undergoes cesarean section and it is a third child and third child is a girl child. Uh, the husband immediately vanishes from the site and the uh, grandmother of the child says, this is not our child because we have had an ultrasonography uh, examination and uh, uh, the doctor has told that it is a boy and we have paid 25,000 for the sex determination. Probably they have gone to a quack or somebody has fooled, but whatever is the outcome is this is what happens. And I don't know really what is the fate of that beautiful girl baby which is which was born that particular day whether she's abandoned deserted or put up for um, adoption so uh, i uh, sometimes wonder why, why do we have to really push up for the two child norm uh, is a population explosion that big a problem because we are almost reaching the TFR rate, total fertility rate of two point, I mean, uh, which uh, two point one, that is our target. We are almost two point two three, and I really uh, don't understand whether it is the reproductive freedom or coercion of the two child norm which is happening in our country. So now we have issues with child marriage. You know the age of marriage. I guess uh, I have to be a little fast. Age at marriage is real uh, an issue because if you look into the uh, graph over here, you can see that the poorest of the girls are married between the age. So you can see over 43 percentage of the girls are married of between 15 to 19 percent. Did they have a choice? And you can see that among the rural um, women they are married off even earlier than the urban and the riches do have a choice when compared to the poor women because they could uh, to some extent delay their marriage so what are the problems of child marriage you all know that uh, um, it results in unplanned pregnancy complication and there is a high incidence of domestic violence by the male partner uh, in child marriage they have early pregnancy without spacing and um, they're prone uh, particularly to the sexually transmitted diseases and they have serious mental health issues. Gender-based violence is yet another issue. So during uh, in one of the primary health centers where our students are posted, uh, the punishment for denying sex to the husband was that he inserted uh, an entire ball pen into the woman's urethra. And the woman wakes up in the pain during the sleep and uh, she cries. And uh, uh, some of them uh, fortunately bring her to the uh, PHC. And um, the uh, doctor there was present and he was skilled enough to remove the pen. So this is a type of violence. But interestingly, this lady suffered in silence throughout the procedure and she was not even willing to report the case because it has been ingrained in the woman's, woman's thought that whatever happens behind the door has to remain there and the violence should not be reported and it is a part and parcel of your married life. So I, I really feel pity on this, ki uh, this uh, kind of violence uh, which are experienced by women and with this lockdown 
um, Punjab from Punjab, highest number of women they have reported uh, sexual violence followed by Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, and various other states. And uh, marital rape is yet another issue which does not even have uh, uh, any scope in our law. And genital mutilation still occurs in uh, border communities uh, for some tribal areas. There are uh, rape, abduction, caste based violence, dowry related death, honor killing. You exercise uh, your right to choose a partner and you have a death of honor. You have acid attack for uh, rejecting uh, a partner. And these are all seen in the uh, declining sex, sex, sex ratio, which is again a gender based violence. So these are some of the health impacts of gender based violence. You have physical consequence, psychological consequence, uh, and also a lot of mental health issues with increased susceptibility to sexually transmitted disease. So um, the intimate partner violence is a hidden pandemic and all the women in our country has to be empowered. So who do you think carries a baton? Even though the males are the one, are the, uh, the chief perpetrators of the violence, it is the woman who passes the baton of patriarchy from one generation to another. I uh, presume majority of you will agree with it because until and unless a woman changes, her concept of patriarchy, right, autonomy of the women. So the mother-in-law passes on to the daughter-in-law and this keeps uh, passing on from generation to generation and vicious cycle. And there are health uh, issues uh, uh, and uh, I mean the impact of health issues on sexual and reproductive health, for example, tuberculosis in pregnancy. A pregnant woman with tuberculosis has a major impact on health um, with the increased incidence of intrauterine death, IUGR, and also has high risk of passing on to the infection to the children in the family. And also she is isolated by the husband and uh, she is deprived of care. There are various cases in India. Cancer uh, affects uh, the reproductive and health choices for the women. And you know the breast cancer and cervical cancer uh, in India is a leading cause of uh, uh, death due to cancers among women and the endometrial cancer also contributes to a small percentage. So what happens is once a woman is uh, diagnosed of cancer, then she is most of the time denied uh, uh, treatment. She is sometimes put out of the house. Uh, she is deserted. So one of the best approach is uh, taken place, I mean, taken by government of Tamil Nadu, whereby they have screening of breast for breast and cervical cancer. And there is high rate of early detection. And it's an excellent model which has to be imparted. But the positive of the model or the drawback of the model is there is no follow up of the treatment services. Similarly, infertility is something which causes a huge impact on sexual and reproductive health of women, as well as the mental health. So I don't have to tell much about it because if you are born or if you belong to a um, economically underprivileged category in the country, you do not have the resources for uh, availing uh, infertility services. So marriage is closely associated with bringing up, uh, bringing, bringing forth offsprings in our country. So if the woman is not able to bear children, she is excluded from all kind of social gatherings, social ceremonies, and she is considered as bad woman uh, to the family and the society. These, uh, does these women have a choice to they stand uh, could they stand for their rights to ponder? So mental health and reproductive health are encountered at various stages and uh, related to menstruation, menopause, infertility, HIV, STDs, families, health issues like uh, uterine prolapse and obstetric fistula, which has to be addressed uh, by um, the healthcare providers. So these are some of the major recommendation, major law recommendation. For example, uh, the POSCO uh, law has to 
be reformed so it it uh, says that it is mandatory for reporting uh, the sexual assault but even before that the law law has to be reformed in such a way that the counseling services should be available even before the reporting are uh, taken so there are so many other laws which requires reformation there should be education and access to information legal protection from violence and victim care and uh, there should be non discrimination at all health uh, centers there should be promoting and protecting reproductive rights improve access to social determinants of reproductive health the health infrastructure should be strengthened there should be capacity building of uh, human resources with regular training and evidence based uh, information and there should be re uh, strengthening reproductive health services right from the school level monitoring data for accountability of healthcare services and services for young people so this is a journal i would like to quote uh, from the american journal of nursing uh, which uh, just published in 2017 january thereby the american nurses are front lines for improving adolescent and sexual reproductive health across the country so it is high time that indian nurses and midwives take up the role because until and unless we empower our adolescents we are not uh, we are losing a chance on imparting uh, a chance uh for develop a sex a healthy sexual development among adolescents so i would like to quote amritya sen that is poverty is not just lack of money it is not having the capacity to realize one's full potential as human being so being poor do we really have a choice for sexual and reproductive health so as healthcare providers as parents as sisters as friends we need to promote sexual health and reproductive health on may 28 let us all take an oath to promote some action however small it is in various areas on sexual and reproductive right to see that we uphold all the rights and services to this women especially the marginalized women to uh, contribute to a healthy nation building thank you from all uh, the family members of aims book nature and once again i thank you all wholeheartedly for giving this wonderful opportunity thank you thank you ma'am now we finish by this today you can ask the ma'am participant yeah hello amisha this is uh, it's not clear what you said you are saying about uh, uh, i think chat box there are no doubts audience want to ask any questions is a time for discussion you may raise any questions now yeah i think no one so we'll move to vote of thanks uh, our somebody, i can see somebody who has raised a hand in the chat box no comments amisha can you see any comments in the youtube link is there any comments uh, no no queries no queries no. yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Bensi, you have uh, muted uh, yourself. Mute. Please unmute. Sorry, ma'am. Good afternoon to all. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this eagles lecture. First and foremost, I thank Anupoya deemed to be university for allowing us to conduct this program. We are great, grateful to our resource person, Dr. M. V. Smitha. Associate Professor of Ames College of Nursing for her valuable time. Madam has explained regarding the reproductive rights, government programs, and how to make the choices. The concept was well explained with the examples and case scenarios in a simple manner, and I am sure that all of our participants are benefited from your talk. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank our principal, ma'am, Dr. Lena Casey, for the encouragement and support to conduct this program. 
I take immense pleasure to extending my sincere thanks to Dr. Padma Priya, HOD, Department of OBG Nursing, Ms. Amisha Amin, Webinar Coordinator, and the organizing team for their effort to make this program a successful one. My heartfelt thanks to the IT Department of Annapoya Dean to the University for the technical support. I thank all the delegates of the program for showing their interest to participate the this lecture on women's reproductive health, the freedom to make choices. Once again, thank you all for your kind attention. Have a nice day. Hello? Hello, Smita Madam? Hello, ma'am. Sita, ma'am, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. There's a question from Susan, ma'am. Susan, ma'am, can okay. you ask the Christmas person? Madam Susan is there? Yes, I'm online. No. Yes, ma'am, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, do we have uh, any studies done on uh, contraceptive use among adolescent girls in and um, in the schools and colleges? Oh, there are plenty of studies, ma'am. Uh, but uh, as see, yeah. I myself did a study on knowledge, attitude, and practice during my uh, UG days. Okay. Um, so the, uh, it was a self-report study. I had uh, administered uh, the questionnaire, and the contraceptive use uh, in 2003 was uh, 27 percentage. But if we look uh, into the, I, I guess Dr. Maxi, please submit your mind. There are plenty of studies, ma'am. Uh, yes, yeah, there are plenty of studies, but it is under the okay. uh, And recently, our uh, UG students they did a study on contraceptive use. So, uh, if you see, there is a huge gap. So, if you look into the sexual, see, we Indians normally uh, tend to believe that adolescents are not sexually active, but um, we know the instance my own children they come and say among their friend group friend groups and among friends they they are very sexually active okay so the contraceptive use may be there but we do not know how far they are using it correctly we can see the data from the private hospitals the abortions uh, uh, rates are quite high among the adolescents so that itself shows that the rate of contraceptive use is less and even if they are using they do not know the proper way of using that shows a severe gap see uh, when i was in karnataka i offered uh, services to a particular school uh, say, uh, we, uh, you know in father mulla sister jacinta she would go around schools and give uh, talks on sex education so this is a particular hindu uh, management run school and i talked to the management regarding imparting sex education and they said this is against our cultural values and uh, children might uh, be uh, 
uh, you know, they, they might have the urge to experiment with sex and contraceptives if you give this kind of education. So majority of the, I mean, some of the states like Karnataka uh, is backward when it comes to imparting comprehensive sex education. I guess, ma'am, I... Yeah. Actually, um, from India, there are very few studies being reported on contraceptive use among college, college girls and uh, school girls. Whereas if you see in the African country, we have a lot of studies uh, with uh, supporting data which show that uh, um, st students are being exposed to that. But the choice that is available to them, you know, the choices that are available, that is limited. And very often students are uh, not, they do not have adequate information on the correct use. So as you, as I, as you just said earlier, that uh, the schools think it is against their tradition. And of course, when we come from a very conservative society, we think that our students are, our girls are not to be exposed to such kind of education, which is wrong. And I think from this, webinar at least and a uh, um, lot of uh, comments should be put forward to the stakeholders um, on the need for um, you know um, having a, um, I mean exposing students to um, awareness on contraceptive use when along with sex education on the right use of contraceptive uh, contraceptives because this is something that we need to, you know, um, accept now. We cannot say that uh, this is not in our tradition because children are being westernized, modernized, exposed to modern culture. We need to move along with that. In Africa itself, we have so many students um, uh, with teenage pregnancy and, uh, of course, um, uh, after that, there is high school dropout and thing. These are problems that we are facing here with the girls. But um, um, I, along with that, we have students, I mean, uh, contraceptive education being given in the school. Awareness is being given. Yes, ma'am, I agree with you, ma'am. We really need to do something as uh, nurses and midwives for uh, uh, better uh, informative services for our adolescents. It is uh, a yeah, need of the time. Yeah, that will come out only when we have enough and more studies done in not only in one or two places, but all over in yeah, many parts. If you parts of look into the Gatmochur uh, website, you can see periodically they are conducting uh, studies on adolescent reproduction and health. So this particular institute is uh, doing a continuous study and they are publishing data on uh, adolescent sexuality and the unmet need for contraception among, among adolescents. Uh, I could send across the data, ma'am, if you could uh, send your email ID. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for the valuable input. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very informative talk. And it's the need of the hour now. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Maxi wanted to tell something. I'm not able to see her. Has she left? Sorry, I, I don't have anything to say. I'm sorry. I forgot to switch off my oh. audio. Oh, OK, OK. That's nice. Nice seeing you, Maxi. Thank you, Susan, ma'am. Thank you, Smita, ma'am. Any other queries? Susan, ma'am, I'm Janet Miranda. I don't know you remember me. Uh, I was in Padamallas. Right now, I am in Yenapoya in OBG department. Whether you remember me, ma'am, Susan, ma'am. Pardon? Uh, do you remember me? I'm Janet. I don't have camera to on it. 
Okay, okay, yes. Uh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I was in Padamullas. Uh, in the quarters ah. when you were there, I was to, I was a nursing student there. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you were in Fadamulis uh, quarters, no, ma'am. Yeah, uh -huh. same campus. I was staying there. Okay, Janet. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. ma'am. Um, I don't know. You may not recall my face. <laughs> now which I am in Menapoya. Yeah. <laughs> which batch? Which batch? I'm uh, <clears throat> Lena. So principal Lena is in batch only, ma'am. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> now she's a principal here. And, yeah. uh, hmm. So nice to reconnect with my uh, <laughs> college staff. And... Yes, ma'am. We were not knowing. Uh, when we saw the registration, then we saw you. Then someone did the, some uh, search, where are you, to find out. And through Facebook, they found out that you are there. <laughs> That's how I, the beginning session I introduced you. Thank you. Thank you, okay, ma'am. Okay, shall we leave the group? Yeah. Okay, okay. Now someone on the camera. Can you see me, ma'am? <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Camera. Okay. Yeah, it's right. This is the camera. But I'm speaking. <laughs> Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Ah, Vinita. No, Vinita's me camera that is mobile. I'm Janet. Janet. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, shall we leave the group now? Okay, ma'am. Bye-bye. Okay, ma'am. Bye. -bye. Okay,